Good morning. We thank and praise God for this opportunity to be here on today. Uh, God has been good to us. He's blessed us to see another day which we've never seen before. Uh, we want to give honor and respect to Pastor Meredith, Dr. Felker, and Sister Felker. We hope that things are going well with you on today. As well as to our trustee chair, Sister Gloria Williams, and Brother Eugene Williams. We hope and pray that things are going well for you today. And our deacon chairman, Deacon Milton Taylor, as well as Sister Repsy Taylor. We hope that you are improving and getting better as well. And to each, new, to each and every one of you that make up our brown bag Bible study, as we like to call it, uh, we're hoping uh, even that um, Deacon Irby, who normally is, is with us all the time and viewing us all the time, we're hoping and praying and saying hello to him uh, that he's with us on this morning as well because we know we can count on him to be with us online uh, on whatever uh, venue that we're sharing, whether it's Sunday school or whether it's worship. Our Bible study, and we thank him for that. We want to continue to pray his strength in the Lord. And all of those that are constantly recovering and getting stronger and better, we thank God for each and every one of you. Brother James Taylor as well, uh, as he is going through a series uh, of examinations uh, to get himself strength, strong and to a regular quality of life as well. We're praying for you, brother, uh, as well. Uh, and so, and those uh, members and friends of Mount Carmel, uh, that share with us on today as we continue our study in the book of Nahum. Uh, the study of the book of Nahum and what I like or feel compelled to call severe compassion. And we're going to really get a chance to see some of that because uh, the compassion that God gives is severe. But check this out. The compassion that he calls on us to be and do is severe as well. And uh, there's one thing when we talk about the prophecy of this book, and I think when we first started, uh, we made mention of it uh, as it relates to uh, it's just a small book, three chapters, and it's a prophecy that has already come into fruition. Okay, so now why are we looking at it? Well, we're looking at it because we're going to make absolutely sure that we understand that the truth of God are still real. And not only are the truths of God still real, the consequences of sin are still real. And so it becomes important for us to understand that, and we learn that out of this book. Uh, especially when we look at such a small book as this that's also referred to as the gospel, according to Nahum, because we see a lot of what Jesus uh, uh, does and exemplifies uh, and calls on us to do and what he has done for us that comes out of this prophecy as well. Now, this is our sixth session, and uh, this is actually part three of what uh, I call uh, what looks impossible is possible. Evil will be defeated. And this is part three. Now, just before we get into that, we're going to do our opening passage of Scripture, and then we're going to have our invocation. Our opening passage of Scripture is coming from that familiar one, Psalm 51, verses 1 through 13. And then we're going to have our invocation. I'm going to read it today in the New International Version. Beginning at verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Verse 5. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Verse 7. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Verse 10. Create in me a, a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for allowing us this opportunity to see another day which we've never seen before, the health and strength that you've given us. We ask you would invoke your blessing upon us at this time as we come together to study and share in your word. Be with those who are here with us in person, O oh God, and we thank you for that. Be with those who have logged in to be with us. 
We ask that you would be with those that had a desire to be with us in person as well as had a desire to log in and could not. Continue to keep them in every way that you see fit. These things we ask in thy son Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So now, when we look at uh, today's study of the lesson, we want to, first of all, as I normally like to do, kind of backtrack a little bit and bring you a little bit up, back up to date from where we were on last time. And so it became important that one of the things that we shared on last week was that how even in the midst of what looks like the victory of evil, uh, when we look at Nahum chapter 2, particularly in verse 2, we see that God gives him a message that says, For the Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob like the splendor of Israel, even though the devastators have devastated them and destroyed their vine branches. Now, having looking at that, looking at that, we see that, brothers and sisters, God's restoration of his people is connected to the judgment and destruction of their enemies. And this is God's guarantee. Not only is God going to bless you, but he's going he's to get those who brought evil upon you. And that becomes important for us to understand that. And it's something that we can trust God to do. That's his guarantee. As he said in Nahum chapter 2, verse 2, same God that said that is the same God that we serve and worship today. Amen. Now, it's important for us to also remember that we must know that evil can be considered as a stronghold. You know, you hear a lot of, the, of, the, of quotes from the scripture, perhaps, is talking about breaking the strongholds and things of that sort. Uh, when we're talking about evil, evil is considered a stronghold. And so it becomes important for us to understand that God showed the people of that time in the time of Nahum, as well as the people of our time, that strongholds can and strongholds will be defeated. So now it becomes important for us to understand that we must know, the church must know, the Christians must know that we can defeat the strongholds, the evils that have taken our families and our countries into captivity. There's a lot of stuff going on in this world. And you know, and we just shared it on Sunday when we uh, alluded to the passage of scripture of 2 Chronicles 7 and 14 that says, If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven and heal their sins and forgive, forgive their sins and heal their land. Okay, it becomes important for us to understand that it's a condition as relates to, and not only a condition, but an expectation that God has of his people. Okay, so while we're talking about all of these bad people and what they're doing, maybe we need to also be looking at, find ourselves looking at all of the good people and what they are not doing. Okay, so now, it's important for us to understand that God has given us the tools to defeat what looks impossible. Those tools are, first of all, obedience to the Holy Spirit. Those tools are humility. Some of those tools are prayer, fasting, and scripture. These are things that are important for important tools for saints of God to have if we are going to defeat what looks impossible. If we're going to break the strongholds, brothers and sisters, we got to make sure that we are obedient to the Holy Spirit. Make sure that we humble, that we're humble. Make sure that we have a prayer life. Make sure that we fast and make sure that we go through the word of God and know the word of God. Not only go through it, but let the word of God go through us. These are things that will enable us to defeat what looks impossible, and that is evil. Amen. Now, the church today, unfortunately, uh, has the challenge uh, to, to tie up or to bind the strong man. And what is the strong man? The strong man is referred to the evil influences of this world. We, we referred to it on last week. I'm going to uh, bring it back in here now. Jesus says in the gospel in Matthew chapter 12, verse 29, in the New American Standard Bible, he says these words, or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first ties up the strong man and then he will plunder his house? Now, it's important for us to understand when we look at a passage like this, what it is saying to us, brothers and sisters, is that we are to advance against Satan's strongholds knowing without a doubt that they must fall. Not only can they fall, but they must fall. Amen. Now, unfortunately, many today wonder, how can this be true? Because evil looks so powerful. It becomes important for us to understand that 
when we see much of the world, and then we see that Christianity seems to be in a bit of decline. Folk are not going to church as much as they used to, and I'm not just talking about the pandemic uh, and, and how it is caused, but people are just not trusting, not worshiping as they used to, or even not living. And so when we see that Christianity seems to be in decline, we see that the things that we did to make people do uh, to call people to do and to see what is right to do, uh, we don't tend to do those things anymore. And what do those things translates into? They translates into uh, the unfortunate reality of moral standards in the United States having changed for the worse rapidly in recent years. And the thing about that, brothers and sisters, is this. The powerful and the influential examples of Christianity have weakened. Okay? And that's just the reality that we need to face. But now, the question that many Christians are now thinking is whether we truly have the power to stand against Satan's kingdom, let alone destroy it, because it looks like evil is winning on every hand. Evil is winning in every community. Evil is winning within every family. And it can make Christians seem overwhelmed and not begin to believe, let alone trust the reality that God will give us the victory. Because it becomes important for us to understand that. Now, now, the question still stands, and it is still the same. The Bible clearly says that Christians have the power necessary to make Satan flee. The Bible says it. I don't write it. I just preach it and teach it. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it becomes important for us to understand there's a truth in the Bible that, that you don't hear very much of anymore. And not only do you not hear very much of it anymore, you don't see a lot of it much anymore either, okay? Now, uh, the problem is not whether or not the Bible is sufficient or not, because the Bible, brothers and sisters, is not insufficient. The Bible is sufficient, but the church has a methodological problem. You see, we want to accomplish Jesus' great commission, but we don't want to use his method. Mm. Now, I hope you got your seatbelts on for this particular section because this really calls on us. This can be quite challenging for us when we're getting ready to go with this now, okay? Now, remember, God has given us the tools to defeat what looks impossible. What are those things? I'm gonna repeat them again. Obedience to the Holy Spirit, humility, prayer, fasting, and scripture. But again, I wanna repeat something else that I said earlier. We want to accomplish Jesus' great commission without using this method. What's the great commission? Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the world. Now, we love the lo, I part. That he's going to be with us. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. He's going to be with us. But we don't realize what it's going to take to do the things of the great commission. Listen, now, there are words about personal sacrifice that we are not ready to hear, okay? Listen, Jesus charged the church to take up the cross. Now, that doesn't mean that we're supposed to just walk casually down the street carrying a cross on our shoulders. You know, and sometimes we tend to think that, you know, well, you know, I'm carrying my cross. What does that mean? What does that mean to you when you actually are talking about carrying your cross? Do you recognize that that has to do with personal sacrifice? Do you realize that that has to do with you going against the world? Oh, check that. That has to do with the world coming up against you. Because remember, Jesus wasn't carrying that cross uh, because everybody loved him or because he hated anybody. He loved everyone and they hated him. Okay? So it becomes important for us to understand that. So listen, we're supposed to endure lives of dishonor before a watching world. We're supposed to sacrifice ourselves for the sake of God's glory. As we become weak, God will respond. He will do his work through our lives and our deaths. Those around us, or those around us who hated God would be confronted with his holiness, and they'll experience that holiness through our lives and through our sacrifice and through our love, through our compassion, and, and through our unwavering continuity, con continuity of being who we are living for him, even as we live in a world that doesn't want us to do the things that we want to do or want us to do things that we should not do.
Okay, so what you see that, that that those around us who hate God would be confronted with His holiness, and then they would be confronted with their sin. But then, as there as the holiness of God confronts their sin, they open themselves up to God, and then God engages them with His grace. Amen. And that's easier said than done, but it's something that must be done. You see, brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit will bless our work. He'll take our broken lives and multiply our seed as it falls to the ground. Okay, our life is supposed to be a life of sacrifice. Our life is supposed to be a life of being our brother's keeper. Okay, that becomes important for us to understand that. But instead, we choose a different path. We would be cool. We would be relevant. We would show the watching world that they could keep their lives as is and just add Jesus to it. Just mention Jesus a little bit more. Just say some things about God a little bit more. Just stop cussing as much as you used to. We haven't talked about the life change that must happen. Okay? Instead of using the methods of the apostles, we have adopted secular marketing techniques and increased the sizes of our buildings. And while all of this is going on, brothers and sisters, the salt has lost its saltiness. Or in the language of the King James Version, the, the salt has lost its savor. We're doing stuff that really look good, but at the end of the day, our lives being changed. Okay? When people talk about who it is that they're watching on television, when people talk about who it is whose book they bought, when people are talking, but are your life, is your life being changed? Okay? And, and who is being a part of that change? And then look in the mirror and say, what am I doing? What are you doing to change someone else's life? What are you doing to break the strongholds of evil that are in your family, that are in your society, that are in your community, that are in your workplace, that are in your church? Something to think about it. I told you to keep them seatbelts on. Listen, why then do we believe that whether it's sound systems or giant televisions or sports fields or things that are attractive alone will be effective in dismantling Satan's kingdom. Listen, we're not just, listen, we're not just talking about getting people, getting the word of God in front of people. That's good. That's important. We're not just talking about praising and worshiping God. That's good. That's important. But we're talking about Engage in the gates of hell because the Bible says upon this rock I build my church and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. So it becomes important for us to understand or ask ourselves the question, how can we expect huge edifices and coffee shops and entertaining speakers win spiritual victories? All those things are good. And listen, I'm not, I, I'm not hating on anybody. Okay. Those things are good. But are they winning us spiritual victories? Where's the spiritual victory? Where's the life change? Okay? Where is the evil being defeated? Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, I must say that while I agree with many that none of these things are bad, we need to have effective methods and methodologies of reaching out people. We need to use social networks. We need to use sound systems. We need to have screens. We need to have stadiums in which we can reach numbers of people. Those things are good, but I'm only saying that we should consider the weapons that we use. Listen, if you go to confront an enemy who is immeasurably, immeasurably more eloquent, because Satan is, more powerful, more shrewd, more tactical, more experienced, and definitely older than you or I, why would we just choose buildings and media alone? Okay? We must really be prepared to engage evil, the evils of our societies. Amen. Now, having said all of that, it becomes important for us to ask ourselves a question. And one of the questions should be, what methods are we using to engage Satan? I mean, because remember now, we're not supposed to be running from Satan. Satan's supposed to be running from us. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Flee means to, you know, to leave hurriedly, even if it's not for a long time, okay? 
but there has to be some engagement. And so the question we should have, what methods are we using to resist him, to engage him? The other question is this, how are we going to destroy his kingdom? God said we was going to do it. God said we, God gave us success. And we just can't sit back and say, well, I just can't wait till Jesus get here and straighten all this out. I can't wait till Jesus come back. Man, oh man, oh man. What are you going to do in the meantime? Okay, so it becomes impossible. Remember now, what looks impossible is possible. Evil will be defeated. The message that we're getting out of the book of Nahum is that when people allow themselves uh, to allow evil to overwhelm them, it ultimately defeated them. And it calls for their own personal destruction. And we don't want that to happen to us. We don't want that to continue to happen to our people. You see, brothers and sisters, you must choose carefully and start with the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our personal lives. We must do what he says. <laughs> if we are honest, we have judged the methods of Christ too costly. You know, we talk about carrying the cross, but many folk, many folk, pardon my grandma, many folk ain't carrying no cross. And when I'm talking about carrying a cross, I don't mean just putting a cross around your neck, okay? Uh, or just to say that I'm carrying my cross, okay? Carrying a cross, it means to be able to, to be willing to engage those that don't want to engage you, to be able to, to be willing to witness to people, even when they won't, don't want to hear your witness, to be able to testify to those who are tired of hearing your same testimony, okay? What are you going to do to continue to be able to tell wrong people that they are wrong and to commend right people when they do right? It becomes important. And refuse to get mixed up when the two things try to get scrambled up, okay? You see, it becomes important for us to understand that. But now, if we're honest, there are many people, and I hope well, you are not one of them, who have looked at the methods of Christ as too costly. We've sought to be Christians, and we want to win the world without living the world-rejected life that Jesus requires. Jesus plainly said these words, brothers and sisters, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. He said that in Luke chapter 14, verse 27. It becomes important for us to understand that we cannot be cool or honored or even respectable in the world's eyes. Okay? I'm talking about, you know, we can't live a life that the unsaved world appreciates. Okay? Now, the unsaved world may respect your life and not want to live it. But we ought not to live a life where the, the unsaved world can't tell our lives from theirs. It becomes important. We can't, we can't remove the strongholds if we continue to do this, brothers and sisters. It becomes important for us to understand that Jesus told his disciples, I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. And listen, and they hate you because you're doing what is right. And you're living how you should live. And you're witnessing about the truth of Christ. And the victories that God has provided. That Satan doesn't like that. And that's why people will not, you know, sometimes, haven't you ever wondered sometimes when you're trying to do good stuff and, and you get into it and end up engaging with people in, in a bad way, uh, people get mad and angry at you and you say, you ask yourself, what did I do? You know, and, 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 and the answer to that question is if you're doing God's will, Satan's going to figure out a way to put you in a negative light with somebody. So it becomes important for us to understand it. So now, as we wrap up today, uh, we just want to make sure that you understand how important it is as we go through these chapters of Nahum to realize and recognize how they apply to us. We've been giving you the story of Nahum for some time now, and as we shift and looking in the mirror of our own lives and seeing where we are in the midst of this, where do I fit in this? We can see that, brothers and sisters, it's important for us to understand that what looks impossible is possible. Evil will be defeated. Okay? Well, that's it. That's it. That's all for today. Um, we uh, look forward to what you're sharing with us on next time. Uh, those of you uh, who have not been with us, we do invite you to come out and be with us uh, on Friday night uh, at 7 o'clock, 7 p.m. Central Daylight Time for our... Uh, church anniversary revival is the Friday night 
uh, this coming Friday. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you with us. Uh, we thank God for all that uh, Dr. Colvin has shared with us, and, and we are thankful for uh, all that we have. We've had a tremendous celebration. We've had a great time. And if you come a little early, uh, we have a little light refreshment prepared. So you can come early, and you can get you a little something uh, to eat to just tide you over until you get home. And uh, we're not here a long time, but we're here. We have a strong time. Okay, we have a good time in the Lord. We're not rushing to get out, but we're doing it decent and in order. And the Holy Spirit is really doing a great job of guiding us in the worship, the messages that, that God has given Dr. Colvin. Uh, we thank God for him and, and the ministry of our singers uh, and all of those that are doing ministry in the church at every level. We thank God for each and every one of you. So we want you to look forward. We look forward to seeing you on this coming Friday uh, at 7 o'clock. Uh, a little before seven, get you something to eat and share with us. Get you something physically to eat. And then at seven o'clock, uh, the spiritual food will be served by Pastor Colvin. So we also want to, to uh, put into the text box those names that you may want us to pray for. Uh, we thank God. It could be you. It could be somebody that you know. Uh, we're thankful for all that God has done for each and every member of our family and our church family and the victories that he's given us and the people that he's restoring and strengthening. And we ask that God will continue to keep him in each and every way. And so we're going to prepare to have our closing prayer at this time, and then we'll go down from this place. Gracious God, we thank you for allowing us this opportunity to come together and share. We actually be with those names of those who are sick, those who are shut in, uh, those who are on their way or preparing for uh, surgeries and procedures. We ask that you guide those that see to her, see to their care. Uh, those that have been uh, receiving uh, different methods and different uh, ways of care uh, from their physicians and their doctors and their hospitals. We ask that you continue to guide and keep and strengthen them in every way. And then, oh God, we ask that you continue to be with us, even those of us who are caregivers. Continue to keep us and strengthen us and give us the strength that we need and the patience that we need to be there for our family members. We ask you to continue to keep us now. Dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. It's in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, thank you all for sharing with us. We want to thank our camera person, Sister Jones. Say hello, Sister Jones. Hello, everybody. Okay. And so until next time, definitely we'll see you on Friday. But until next Wednesday, take care and God bless.